All right, so hi, my name is Arnaud Leors, I'm from IBM, I'm part of the Open Technology Group. I'm an open source, open standard specialist, I've done that all my career, which is about 30 years now. And uh, so, uh, what I want to talk to you about today is the latest project I've been working on, which is Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, so, uh, this has been going on for three years now. We essentially launched Hyperledger three years ago with the Linux Foundation. One thing that I do want to clarify to get started is there are a lot of people who say, oh, we, I use Hyperledger. And I always say, how do you use a consortium? Because Hyperledger is not a software, it's a consortium, right? And so that's the first point I want to make quickly. Hyperledger is basically it's, a, it's technically it's called a collaborative project. It's hosted by the Linux Foundation, which has become over the years into what I call like a meta consortium. It's a consortium of consortiums. And so instead of creating a consortium from scratch, you can instead go to the Linux Foundation and create a collaborative project. And they basically have the class consortium and they can do new consortium for you. And for some money, they manage everything. And so it's much faster and much easier to create a consortium that way. So when IBM started working seriously into blockchain, we started in, uh, you know, obviously we have a lot of people in crypto and research. It's, and, and so they were looking at that for a long time. But when we started looking into it from a business point of view, we realized, okay, this is the kind of technology. It's peer-to-peer -peer network. You can't have that as a proprietary solution. It has to be open source based. And IBM has a long history in open source. This is actually my 20th year at IBM, and I'm happy to say I've only worked on open source and open standards since then. So this is nothing new for IBM. It's part of our DNA. So in this case, we actually approached the, the Linux Foundation. They were interested in creating a, a consortium to host development uh, of blockchain technologies. And so we created Hyperledger. There are actually five different blockchain networks today hosted by the Hyperledger project, okay? So that's why when I say, you know, when people say I use Hyperledger, I'm like, well, what do you use? Because they are, typically people mean Fabric because it's the most prominent, the most popular blockchain network that, or framework that people use. But if you want to shorten it because Hyperledger Fabric is kind of long, you can say Fabric. Just don't say Hyperledger because that's too confusing, okay? I'm not going to get into the details of all of this, but as I said, there are different frameworks, and some of them are really interesting. Uh, Sawtooth was actually contributed by Intel, and it has an alternative to proof of work called proof of elapsed time, where they're leveraging uh, secure hardware, which they happen to sell, uh, SGX, but uh, it actually achieves the same result of proof of work without consuming any energy. Uh, but there are other projects and Borrow, for instance, is another one which comes from, which is an implementation of the Ethereum virtual machine. So people think that, you know, Hyperledger competes with Ethereum. It's not exactly true. Uh, and uh, Hyperledger Indy is a specific uh, soft, uh, uh, framework and, and a set of libraries. I think there was a presentation this morning uh, from Rich. Uh, uh, so it's dedicated to managing uh, self-sovereign identity backed by blockchain. It's very interesting. So, and then there's a bunch of tools as well that kind of builds on those different frameworks. So what is Fabric? And why do you even bother developing Fabric in the first place? It's not like blockchain didn't exist. The problem is a lot of the blockchain frameworks that are out there, they were initially, at least, you know, when we started looking into it, they were really designed as uh, public networks. And uh, when we're looking at it from an enterprise point of view, which of course is IBM's focus, um, we realized there was a big mismatch between the characteristics that uh, the, the business networks typically have traditionally and what the blockchain systems that were offered at the time uh, were uh, providing. And so, you know, to highlight some of the key points that led us to say, okay, well, there isn't one that matches the enterprise needs, so we're going to build one. Uh, for instance, the first thing is businesses do not function in public. They have relationship and they interact with their peers in a private way. So that's number one. They also want high performance because 
Um, so you are familiar with the Ethereum and Bitcoin. You're talking about like you know an order of seven or 10, 15 transactions per second, right? With Fabric, we have over 3,000 3, transactions per second. And last week, there was actually a guy from Cornell University who presented some modification to Fabric where he multiplied that by seven, 25,000 transactions per second. Okay, and so it's quite different. Um, in Ethereum, for instance, they have chosen to try to address security by um, uh, limiting the, the, the programming that you can have in your smart contract. By, so they have the Ethereum virtual machine that sets a, number, a specific number of operations you can have. We made a different choice where we gave people access to you know, traditionally, uh, traditional uh, full-purpose uh, programming languages. Fabric is written in Go, so that's the first language that's available. But you can write your smart contracts in Java as well as Node.js. And I mean, there's essentially a, you know, a plug a pluggable API, so you could possibly support other uh, languages. And um, we have no mining. There is no so notion of gas. Because in the kind of applications we have in businesses, businesses are making money by trading some services on some goods. They are not trying to make money out of running the system, right? So. In fact, a lot of applications in the business case, when they are working with Ethereum, they turn the gas off. They have to basically, I mean, in a permission way, right? They, they use the, so, because it's, it becomes more of an annoyance. And so we didn't put that in at all. And then maybe the biggest difference of all is the consensus process. It's fundamentally different. One thing we wanted to have is finality. So in Ethereum and Bitcoin, for instance, you have forking going on, and then the, eventually, you know, the network will converge back and forth. But that means you really never know whether your transaction, even though it has been validated and put into a block, whether it will stick or not, because it might actually be dropped further down the line. And that's why you have to wait several blocks to start feeling confident that your transaction is not going to be dropped. So that's something businesses do not like, and it also affects performance. Uh, people typically wait three up to 10 blocks, depending on how sensitive you are to this process. Um, so we actually broke down the consensus process, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, next. But uh, we have, uh, yeah, I'll talk more into the detail next. So the we started in 2016 with the first version of Fabric 1.0. There was actually a pre-version of that 0.5.0.6, which we already did. And, um, but so this was the first major release. And we have since then adopted um, a release cycle where every quarter we have a minor release we are publishing. What's interesting is one of the key uh, aspects of Hyperledger is to enforce certain rules. And we're all about open governance. It's not enough to be open source, like, you know, you have this like GitHub repo and there's a group of, of like a company like IBM would, you know, push code on the outside, but they keep control. Hyperledger is about open governance and IBM is a strong believer in this. We have in many other open source projects be a main actor into opening up the governance of the project and so, you can see, obviously, when we started, this was based on a contribution from IBM. All the contributors initially were IBMers because that's what they were. But we have actually worked very strongly, very hard to open up the, the, the project. And you can see that in the latest release, you know, we have almost 300 contributors. A lot of them are not from IBM. I'm not going to lie to you, there's still a major you know, weight carried by IBM. We probably carry about half of the contribution still on our own, but you know, because we have a strong commitment to this and we're building a business behind this, but uh, I'm happy to say that you know, there are many different organizations that are also contributing. So the architecture, and that's where I'm going to talk a little bit about the consensus process that I was referring to earlier. So this is a high-level kind of uh, picture of the architecture. 
Uh, first, at the top, we have membership services. And so don't get, it, don't get fooled. That doesn't mean it's a server and it's centralized. Also. This thing is like distributed, and you can have several of them for each organization participating in the network. But this is what controls access, because we're in a permission network. Then you have on the left side, obviously, there's a client application. It will use some SDK. There are different SDKs available to interact with the network. Then what we have, which is kind of unique to Fabric, most of the time you have some node that you talk to. And the node interacts with the network and does all of the validation, running smart contracts, and all that. In our case, we have actually divided the node into three different functions. Two of them are actually implemented in the same process, which is the one on the right side over there, endorser and committer. And then in the middle, you have the ordering service. What we've realized is that there were really different parts in the consensus process. And the two big ones are, there is a part which has to do with ordering the transactions and it's independent of the nature of the transaction. It's making sure that we all agree on the order in which the transaction happened. Because we're in a peer-to-peer -peer network, transactions flow and come in from any, different, any part of the network. And at some point, we need to agree on the order. And this is how you, by the way, avoid the double spend. Um, and then there is another part which has to do with validating the transaction in terms of, you know, do I have all the information that I need to make sense of the transactions, or, and, and is it valid at this point in time in the logic of the application, right? So the, the quickly, you know, the process flow is the application will submit a proposal to an endorser. This is basically saying, I would like to submit this transaction. The endorser is going to validate that transaction, again, testing those aspects that I just mentioned. That's where it runs the chain code in our case, which is the kind of the, the smart contract. Once the client has gathered enough endorsement, then I'll get to more into the detail of how, what that means, endorsement. It will submit that to the ordering service. Again, this is not a centralized thing. It's a distributed thing. But for the sake of the concept, it's, there's this ordering service. You can see there are four nodes there. They can be as many as you want. It actually can use different algorithms to come to consensus on the order of the transaction that have been gathered. It will cast a new block, and it will broadcast the new block to the system. All the peers that receive the blocks will then go through a validation process to uh, uh, make sure that the endorsement under which, you know, the, the, the conditions under which all the transactions have been validated in the first place is st are still true and then we'll commit that new block to the ledger. Then there's a notification mechanism to inform everybody. So this is basically the process flow. One aspect is that it's final. Again, as I was mentioning, we, we can catch non-deterministic uh, smart contracts. So uh, because then the endorsement you know, will differ from one to another. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that. So membership services, I explained. This is, you know, conceptually, it's the service to which you're going to go to to get keys, to enroll, and have ac gain access uh, rights into the network, right? Um, there is an implementation. So uh, the, the system is designed so that there's, a, there's an interface. You can have multiple different types of implementation. There is isn't one implementation that's built in that's offered called Fabric CA for certificate authority that actually plugs in into many different existing systems. That's another aspect of Fabric. We call it bring your own identity because in the enterprise setting especially, most enterprise already have some identity system, if not more. The last thing they want to hear is, oh, if you want to use a blockchain you know, framework, you have to create a whole new set of IDs. So this system actually allows you to do this with that, to integrate with existing systems. I talked about endorsement policies. Most systems, traditionally blockchain systems, there's this notion of miner that actually does validation, smart contracts that run. 
in reality, in the business case, there are sometimes regulations even that impose you know, certain actors in the network to validate transactions. And not everybody necessarily needs to validate all transactions. So what we have actually is a system that allows you to define the policy under which you know, transactions must be validated. So we have a simple uh, uh, policy language, endorsement policy language, which basically allows you to specify for your channel, for your application, who needs to endorse the transaction for the transaction to be considered valid. So you can see there's an and and or operator. I don't need to get into the detail. I think it's pretty simple and straightforward, but it's enough to allow you to define uh, different policies that fit your needs. And in fact, this is all handled by a specific um, part of the system that's also pluggable. So if you really fancy another policy language that's much richer, you can also implement this. We have also added a notion of multi-channel, which is pretty unique to Fabric. Because when we started, we said, OK, our business networks, they want to work in private, so we are going to allow them to have this permission network. What we actually quickly realized is that even within a network, there were transactions that they didn't necessarily want everybody to see. So multi-channels basically allow you, allows you to further segment the network. So in practice, there are actually different chains. And you can define which participants in the network can see, you know, can access uh, what channel. And that allows you to actually segment the network the way you want. And uh, you can run your smart contracts or chain code, in our case, um, on any different channels. Every possible combination is uh, available. In terms of the roadmap, um, as I said, we have this release schedule where every quarter we have a new release. And um, we just released version 1.4. Uh, this, you know, we were actually slightly late because we should have released in December, but with the holidays and all, we just released it at the beginning of January, but it's out. And so we're barely just a little bit late. The big thing about this is that it's the first long-term support release. So until now, we were, you know, if you found a bug, you basically were told, yeah, just update to the latest release. Now we're actually committed to support 1.4. That means we actually have switched to 2.0. And so I'm going to give you an idea of what's coming up. Um, there is a lot going on in Hyperledger Fabric. And you know, quite frankly, it's a bit overwhelming if you just want to casually try to understand what's going on. Uh, we have gone a long way from, you know, as I said, moving from a proprietary development to an open uh, source uh, with an open governance project. Now the trouble, and I used to, you know, it's part of my role in IBM, is to help the, proper, the product group transition from proprietary, traditional, top-down uh, op uh, development to open source. And, you know, I used to complain that they didn't, you know, uh, provide the community enough information about what was going on. And now we have a bit of an excess of the other way around, which is there is so much information available. So I can't blame them anymore because they have done their work and everything is really open. But now there is a huge amount of information. So, you know, what I wanted to give you, and, and you saw that on the slide before, by the way, you see all these different features that keep being added release after release. What I wanted to give you is an idea of, okay, what are the main axes of development so that you get a better picture of what's going on. And based on your interest, you can look into it. So in terms of privacy, privacy and confidentiality, as I said, we have already had several steps where we started with just permission network, where then we added channels. We keep going on that way, because then there is a notion of private transaction. So a lot of people, they don't want to even put the data into the blockchain. So they want to encrypt the data. They just put the hash on the chain. And then the question is, well, what do you do with the actual data? And so what we have done is we've made it available for you as the application developer to do that automatically. And you can declare certain part of your data to be private. 
And what happens is that we will actually communicate the private data to the other peers that you decided to give access to. The, the data will be hashed, and only the hash will be actually stored on the chain, but the, the, the actual blob of data will be also communicated directly peer-to-peer. Um, we have also, we are going down that way uh, much further. We have now introduced, there's a technology from IBM called Identity Mixer. We're leveraging zero-knowledge proof type of technologies to uh, allow more control over, you know, privacy. In terms of the consensus process, I said it was pluggable. So in the original version of Fabric, we actually had two options. The one's called Solo. It's actually not really a, a consensus process. There's just a server. It's a single node, but it's good for uh, development purposes. And there is Kafka, which is used in production, which is fault tolerant, but it's kind of heavy. So there is development to use Raft, which is another crash fault tolerant system. And then we are moving towards uh, supporting SBFT or PBFT, one of those Byzantine fault tolerant uh, processes. Um, we have made a lot of effort into improving serviceability. Initially in Fabric, if you wanted to change your chain code, you literally had to shut down the whole network, <laughs> update, and then restart, which obviously doesn't work very well in production. So there's, all of this becomes much more automatic now. The system is much more re resilient. And uh, there is a lot of information that you needed to have out of band that is now available directly from the system. It can be pulled from the chain. Uh, we're also improving the, the programming model API. So Fabric is a very low-level API when it comes to data. It's key value pair. What the key means, what the value means is up to you. For Fabric, is they are just bits. So this is a bit hardcore for an application developer. So what we have done now is started to uh, you know, bring a much higher API, much higher level API, so you can talk about assets and things like this. And then there are other the interesting developments. There is one which has to do with being able to support Ethereum virtual uh, uh, machine. So I've talked about Hyperledger Burrow, which was an Ethereum virtual machine implementation that's available in Hyperledger. We have actually, we support putting the Burrow Ethereum virtual machine as chain code on Fabric Network. And we have a Web3 proxy so that you can actually use an Ethereum client that talks to the proxy, and it's, it looks like, to the client, it looks like it's talking to the Ethereum network, but it's actually talking to a fabric network. And on the other side, it's actually executing the Ethereum smart contract, possibly returning solidity, for instance, on, on the fabric network. And there's a new feature called Fab Token, which will allow you to um, deal with fungible assets in a more efficient way with a combination, again, of UTXO, if you're familiar with this model, but also uh, zero-knowledge proof for privacy. Quickly, the way you interact as an application developer with the system, there are two main parts that you need to worry about. There's the client side at the top there, and you interact with the network through an SDK, and there are several SDKs available. And there's the smart contract, which is your chain code. You actually don't have to worry too much about the blockchain unless you want to. Uh, the API at the, the chain code level is just you know, putting data and getting data. All the blockchain -y stuff is actually done for you by the, net, the framework. There are many different tutorials you can start from. Uh, all of that is available open source. The first thing is bring your first network. There's actually, everything is dockerized. It's all con docker containers. So there is a script they can start from. It will pull all the images from the network and it will get started very quickly. And it will run all of this into, to, into, your, into your own machine. And then there is application you can start using to develop. One thing that's important to know is it can be complicated to debug and it's a pain when you get started. So for instance, the chain code is run as a separate container that's forked, that's spawned off by the, con the peer itself. So there is a process, you install your chain code and you instantiate it, and then the peer forks this 
it spawns off the, this container with which it has a very secure connection. The problem is when you want to debug, it's not very convenient. So there's spatial mode, it's important to know dev mode, where you tell the peer don't do that, and you basically start the, the container with the chain code yourself. You have access to this, you can shell into it, and then you start your, your network, and it doesn't spawn off the, the container. So, there are many different APIs. That's one of the goals of Fabric, was to make it extremely flexible because we don't believe in one solution fit all. And so there are different languages available. What does IBM do with this? Very quickly, we actually don't have our own version of Fabric at all. All our developers are working on Hyperledger on a daily basis. We contribute all our code to, to Hyperledger. The only thing we do then is we take this and we basically host it on the IBM cloud and with some tools around it, so monitoring, deployment, uh, we actually uh, allow you to develop your application in the IBM cloud. And then finally, I just want to give you some pointers and I'll make my slides available online, but uh, there are basically two directions you can choose. There is Hyperledger as a bunch of, we, we submit, we publish a whole bunch of documentations and tutorial, but there's also IBM, there's IBM developer website, which has a huge amount of data, uh, code patterns and things like this that you can use to get started. And the IBM blockchain platform, there's a starter plan, which is free to use, so you can get started, get a feel of what it's like. All right, I will stop at this. Thank you. I normally talk two hours on this thing, so I'm sorry if it feels a bit. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you share a few examples how businesses actually use the platform? Ah, yes, yeah. uh, indeed. So I didn't want to get too much businessy, but uh, yeah, it's a good question. It's like, what, what kind of applications? We actually, I'm glad to say we have moved on from just proof of, proof of concept. We actually have different production systems now. And uh, so just to talk about a couple of them, uh, the, there is one called TradeLens. It's a platform we have developed with Maersk to manage all the paperwork associated with shipping containers around the world. And so the idea is that when you ship a container from one place to another, there is a huge amount of paperwork that needs to be uh, uh, taken care of. So it will involve different agents throughout the life of the, the shipment. It starts with like, you know, the shipper companies, of course, but you know, it's the port authorities, it's insurers, tax, tax authorities, the transporter itself. And so we actually have this platform which allows all these different actors to access the chain and add information associated with the container. It actually re it gives a lot more privacy, uh, sorry, transparency, and the, uh, but also it's a lot more secure. There's a lot of fraud in this space because people literally copy, they, they do Xerox of, uh, of paperwork. And it's a huge hassle, it's a huge cost. There's another one called Food Trust, which we've developed initially with Walmart, but now there are other companies like Carrefour are joining, where we are tracing products. So we can uh, tell you the provenance of the chicken that you're buying in the store, and it helps a lot in uh, dealing with like food contamination situations where they do this, this recall, where instead of having to you know, recall huge amount of chickens because there's one farm that got contaminated, we know immediately where all the chickens from that farm are. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering, do you think uh, with the amount of development going to Hyperledger, it might be the leading blockchain software in the future? Like there seems to be a lot of development in it. It might be the what? The leading one. The, the well. Yeah, so, you know, I'm old enough not to believe in, in one, uh, uh, you know, replacing everybody. I've been around the block for too long. So I wouldn't dare to say that, yeah, of course, everybody's going to just use Hyperledger Fabric and that's it. But I do think there's huge momentum and there's really not much reason not to use this one, by the way. Because uh, Hyperledger, what's interesting to know is you can participate in every activity related to Hyperledger without being a member. Individuals or companies alike are welcome to participate. So, 
Yeah, it's a short question. Um, you used uh, word change sets and you used uh, and you didn't provide a repository. So how can I compile it? Because I don't I don't know if do you use Git for your for your work? GitHub? Yeah, no, yeah. not GitHub, but Git in general. Yes, because yes, you yes. Said change sets, and it's set in a one change set. set. Yes. Okay, that I know. It's, it's it from you. Jazz. Yes. Yeah, so, so two different, uh, so just by the way, we do use GitHub, although we actually use Garrett, and on GitHub it's just a mirror, so if you want to become a contributor, you have to use Garrett, but that's a detail. Um, so the change set that I think you're referring to had to do with the, so it's part of the endorsement. When I said, you know, we have to validate at the end when the block comes back from the orderer, what happens is that you know, we don't want to rerun the whole chain code because that can be quite expensive. So what happens in the first step when the peer actually endorses the transaction, it runs the chain code and it essentially simulates the, the, you know, what the, this transaction wants to do, which means that it's actually not going to modify the actual data. It, instead, it actually produces a change set, which is a read-write set. It, it tells you which variables are changed and from what to what, right? And so the last step at the uh, validation process, when after the block has been broadcasted to everybody before it gets committed, what the, the peers do, the committer part of the peer does, is actually go through the transaction and verify that all the chain sets still match the current state. That's how you catch the double spent, so that you know, if I say, okay, I'm giving a dollar to Joe and that same dollar I'm giving it to Bob, only one transaction can be validated. At the time of endorsement, both could be endorsed because every time it says, yeah, it has a dollar, it can give it to Joe or it can give it to Bob. And at some point, you have to reconcile this. Once it goes through the ordering and it says, okay, John is before Bob, well, then at the end, you're going to go through this validation which is a very quick process, it's going to, first it's going to say yes, okay, he has a dollar, he gives it to John, and then the second time it's going to say no, there's no more dollar, it is like the account is zero now, so you cannot give it to Bob, and it could be not zero, but even if it was any change, okay? That's what this refers to. Uh, yes, quickly. So I, I, I see from uh, some uh, links on the web that y you can run uh, Ethereum uh, smart contracts on uh, Hyperledger Fabric. So which one is the direction that is preferred by a Hyperledger Consortium? Uh, because both projects are uh, supported. So uh, is the Fabric going to be the, the one for the future? And then uh, the, the Ethereum uh, Fabric is going to be shut okay, down. So so there, there are two, two uh, I, I can answer this question in two different ways. Because, so you said Hyperledger Consortium. At the consortium level, we don't have an opinion, okay? Uh, and I'm part of the technical steering committee, which is an elected uh, position every year. All the contributors can, be, can run for the technical steering committee, and there's an election. And so as a technical steering committee member, I can tell you that, you know, we, we, eva we, we value every project the same, in the same way and we don't have an opinion. The whole idea of Hyperledger was to provide a venue where the industry at large and all interested parties could come and work together in open source on blockchain related technologies. Now, at the fabric level, uh, we have, as I said, you know, we are now supporting running high, uh, Ethereum virtual machine type of uh, contract uh, on, the, on the fabric network. Uh, I think it's really meant for people who actually are working in Ethereum. They already have developed uh, smart contracts they want to use, and they are looking for a different uh, platform because it has some limitations, uh, whatever, and so it makes transition easier. Uh, because there are a lot of aspects to Fabric which you won't have access through this smart contract API, right? Or on the Web3 API, if that's what you're using. We have this Web3 proxy but you're limited to what's being provided by this API. As soon as you're gonna to want to use all the specific features to Fabric, then you're gonna to have to move out of this space. So I wouldn't, you know, it's clear that this is never going to be the primary API to interact with Fabric. Thank you.
Thank you very much uh, for the talk, and also thank you very much for uh, coming. This was the first time that there was a blockchain dev room on FOSDEM. Uh, we hope as organizers that you liked it. If you have any suggestions how to do things better, contact us on Facebook or uh, Twitter. Uh, and hopefully next year we'll see you again at the next uh, blockchain dev room. Thank you.